Hi, my name is Greg Fritz. I am a practicing physical therapist in private practice in the state of Washington. I am excited that Clarius Mobile Health has asked me to make a presentation to my colleagues on the subject of diagnostic musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging in the practice of physical therapy. There's two different categories of the imaging modalities that are out there that I want to just briefly outline for you and then get into how musculoskeletal imaging fits into this spectrum. First, summation imaging, and then we'll talk about tomographic imaging. In summation imaging, as you can see on this orange framed representation at the letter P, the image from x-rays are of the items in this room summed together or placed on top of each other. And I like to think of it simply as if there were a sofa in that room and your friend was hiding behind that sofa, you would see your friend hiding through the sofa and you would see various items summed together in the picture. And I'm going to give you an example here represented, and I'm going to take my pointer here if you can see that, in the humeral head, you'll see overlaying on this x-ray a lighter image which is actually the coracoid process from the scapula. So this coracoid process is a projection of bone from the scapula that goes what looks like through the glenohumeral joint. But of course it does not. It's in front of this joint. And so what we're actually looking at when we take a look at an x-ray image is everything in front of that x-ray camera. Now a real world example of this is this standing film on a left knee. And you can see that the right plateau gives us plenty of space where the articular cartilage is. Whereas the left plateau is very clearly degenerated. It's very clear that we do not have any gapping in that particular joint. Now if we were to take a picture at 90 degrees, you'd see that if the x-ray was from the anterior aspect through to the posterior, you would see that this little projection of bone from the anterior tibia is actually what is accounting for this density in front of that joint. And in fact, that location of the bony projection, along with the flabella, could be very well making it look as though the joint has no cartilage. That's why when we take a look at the second imaging modality, which is the tomographic slice, things become a little bit clearer. In that same room where objects exist, in a tomographic view or in a MRI or CT slice, we're pulling out of that room the images only associated with that particular slice. And in this case, your friend actually behind the sofa would not be seen at all, but details on the sofa would be very clear. Here's a way I like to look at it. If you were to take a look at an olive loaf, it's possible you'd actually get a whole olive in the slice. And you'd know exactly where that olive was in relation to the slice. If that same loaf was imaged with an x-ray, you'd see multiple olives. You just would not know where those olives were. Now again, in the real world experience, and this is the exact same patient that we took a look at the plain film on, you'd see that in this coronal slice, we are actually able to identify some additional information in the tibia that did not show up at all on those plain films. And if you take a look at this vertical line that represents the sagittal view, that is what this picture in the middle is representing, that slice. And that slice is now pointing out that there is a bony horn, a projection forward that was not able to be seen either on the AP or lateral view because it required that the MRI sliced it that way. And to further identify the shape of that structure, slicing it on the horizon gives us an axial view. And this orange framed picture here represented in that orange circle is what looks almost like a mushroom that's projecting forward and lateral on this tibia. 
musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging is a tomographic slice. That is to say that in the picture of this young lady here, the blue line on the back of her shoulder represents where I have placed the probe. You will see at the very top is her skin. Then below that is the deltoid muscle that you can see the fibroadipose structures showing that this muscle is cut in short axis to the fibers. Below that are the actual tendinous fibers of the infraspinatus tendon. And on this picture here, that infraspinatus muscle would be located in this region and the tendon would span the back of the glenohumeral joint and attach to the middle facet on the greater tuberosity. If you look close, this sphere is the articular surface of the humeral head. So you're already starting to make out that this particular structure here is the glenoid socket. It's the part of the scapula that holds the humerus into place and this fibrocartilaginous triangle is the labrum. So we are able to see the structures of the back of the shoulder at a greater clarity than an MRI tomograph, but that's not even the half of it. Musculoskeletal ultrasound allows dynamic imaging. And what you're actually witnessing here is the movement of this patient's arm into internal rotation, and this is external rotation. You're able to see the muscle changes in dimension of the deltoid simply because the infraspinatus is moving underneath it. And you're able to see in this picture the tendon and insertion, and you see now the muscle fibers of the actual infraspinatus muscle. And if you look close, you'll see that the labrum itself is altering its shape to correspond to the surface of the humeral head. And finally, looking at the picture, this dark region I'm pointing to, to, to right here, and you'll see it come up here, that's articular cartilage. We're actually able to see and dimension whether a patient has articular cartilage in varying views. How ultrasound engineers generate pictures like this simply from sound is so far beyond my understanding that I'm going to refer to something that I call MSKUS physics made ridiculously simple. I'm using Clarius's version 2 high definition L15 to demonstrate the actual source or the probe. From this probe is transmitted sound waves. Those sound waves leave the probe. They then strike something, in this case, this thing of orange, and then they ripple back an echo. And those echoes then are processed based on time and intensity in the actual device and then what comes from that work of magic from the engineers is an actual image that shows up on our iPhone or whatever it is we are actually sending this Wi-Fi signal to. This particular image is the third image I ever took with a musculoskeletal ultrasound device. It was of my 10-year-old son's eyeball. We were actually at a retreat at a medical conference and he came into our cabin and I simply said, hold still. And I put gel on his face and put this right up to his eyeball. And that orange line represents his cornea. And this little football shaped item is the lens. And the vitreous humor behind his eyeball is this dark anechoic region. And I'll tell you, I was hooked. I do want to get into two different parts of physics that are important to my colleagues. The first, frequency and depth of imaging. You will see in the call out here that at 3 megahertz, images can be generated as, as deep as 7.8 inches. Now, for my colleagues that utilize this tool for heating and metabolic um, reactivity within the body. We, in essence, use the friction that's caused by a power intensity that's close to 200 times as strong as imaging ultrasound. 
but we use it on surface tissues. When we are imaging the body, the higher the frequency, the more shallow the picture. The lower the frequency, the deeper we can go. And so clearly for imaging pelvic floor and for imaging abdominal muscle structures, we will be using these lower frequencies. Finally, in the actual meat of physics, I do want to talk a little bit about the attenuation of sound. As a person places the probe over various areas of the body, they'll find that some parts simply don't show good pictures. And part of that is because we have to ask ourselves, how well does sound go through that particular type of tissue? And what I want you to look at on this particular image in the middle on the bottom is that ultrasound does not do air well. If you take a look at the, the, the limitation, and in this case, the higher this number, the worse we get transmission of sound waves through the body. And you can see that lung is at a 40. And you can understand that because bone has different pockets of air in it, it's at a 20. But if we were to go down to water here, you'll see that it's 0 0.002, which means that sound whips through that and does a great job of not getting any type of reduction in signal with that. And as we take a look at what does various tissue look like here in a bit, please keep in mind that it has a lot to do with the density of the tissue we're looking through. Speaking of density, let's get right into echo texture. As you can tell by the top image, that x-ray clearly shows a plate on the lateral aspect of an ankle. And I want you to notice that the ultrasound image below that in the orange frame shows the top three screws in that metal plate. And those top three screws, along with the plate, offer something below them that we call ring down. It's a signature for metal or hardware. But I want to show you, if you look close at the x-ray, you'll see that there's two screws a little higher up. And then that plate will bend up and over the distal fibula. I want you to watch with me as we take a look at that travel underneath the probe. Here are the three screws. You see the two high screws. That plate goes up and over and it stops at the bottom of the fibula. But anything below that, you really can't tell because the density of metal stops that. But what I want to show you is that metal, and below here bone, has an echo return that's very, very strong. It's like shouting at a solid rock wall. You'll hear your echo back very clearly. This is a distal finger, meaning this is your distal phalanx. And I want you to particularly take a look at the bony echoes that you're going to see. And you can't help but be in awe that you're actually able to see the flexor tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus. But particularly as it's lower looking at white lines, I want you to consider this as dense echo texture. So follow along with me here. We're talking distal phalanx. This is the DIP. This is the middle phalanx. This is the proximal phalanx. You can see the metacarpal head. That metacarpal head goes to the base. And we're now seeing carpal bones all the way down to where we're actually seeing the radius, the distal radius. We're able to see tendons here. But that's an aside. I want to have you take a look at bony echo signatures. From there, we're going to go to the, the dark part. And just like we talked about when we took a look at the, the attenuation of signals, we're going to be seeing that fluidy material echoes as black, or what we refer to as anechoic or dark. And if you can go back to my son's eyeball and remember the vitreous humor, that was dark because sound went through that very, very well. This was an 80-some-year-old gentleman who was playing tennis and injured himself because he was actually running backwards, ran right into the, the chain-link fence at the back. And such an energetic man. I love working with these type of people. But I want you to watch as I'm palpating the tissue over his incision. You actually can see waves of fluid that has developed over his thoracic spine. 
Now in this particular view here, you're going to see that this is his skin off to the right. I've, I've rotated the image so it relates to a person standing. And so you'll see here off to the right, the skin and adipose and the fluid that you'll show up as an anechoic or dark structure between the skin adipose and the thoracic fascia. So that when you press on it, it turns into almost a waterbed look where it makes waves under the surface of the skin like I'm showing you here. Now we can also see bladder. And in this particular picture here, you'll see the, the square structure of the bladder. And bladder, of course, has fluid in it. And then finally, to again show you what anechoic uh, fluid looks like, this is a rotator cuff repair gone bad. And if you look close, you'll actually be able to see suture material that's inside of the fluid as this patient clearly took a fall and disrupted the good work of the surgeon. All of this is extracellular fluid in reaction. The takeaway from this is that any tissue that rapidly conducts sound and does not at all degrade it is going to look black or dark. We've talked about what metal looks like and what bone looks like. And on the whole other end of the spectrum, it's liquidy material that comes back echoing this way. So what I want to actually do now is to go to the tissue between. The rest of our body, and your fingers will know this because as physical therapists, we've been palpating tissue, well, I guess our entire career. But if you take a look at this bottom left picture, you'll see that here is my calcaneus, here is my Achilles tendon, and that fibrous material you'll see go from my, my gastroc soleus down and attach to my calcaneus bone. This is the retrocalcaneal bursa. It's serving me to, in essence, periodically lubricate the junction between this um, Achilles tendon and where it goes over the top of the calcaneus. And of course, just for labeling's sake, the Kager's fat pad is located in this same region here, and it kind of helps to lubricate and, and cushion as well. But I want to show you. If you look close at what actually is happening here, I'm taking my foot into plantar flexion, and as I do that, the fluid from this bursa goes in and bathes that. Now I'm going back into neutral or dorsiflexion. Again, I'm going to take this down into plantar flexion. You'll see that it goes down. The Achilles, the, the Achilles tendon pulls up. Lubricant goes in, and that comes back down. But since we're talking about echo texture, remember somewhere between bone and fluid, is the grayscale imaging of fibers of a tendon. And the fatty material of the adipose that's in this Kager fat pad echoes actually quite a bit brighter. We call it hyperechoic, but it's heterogeneous. It looks like scrambled eggs to me. And if you remember your anatomy, when we dissected cadavers, that's exactly what fat looked like, was little pockets of almost scrambled egg material. Now I bring your attention to the middle screen here, and this is my calf. And I want to show you, clearly at the very top is skin. And I'm not a lean individual, so I do carry some fat in most locations. Uh, I want to point out I don't have it above my Achilles tendon. But for whatever it's worth, I do want to show you that the pinnate structures of the gastroc in this long axis view of, my, of the back of my calf the pinnate structures of the gastroc is separated by this fibrotic fascia. And then here's my soleus muscle down deep to that, and it's encapsulated in a fascial layer. Below that is the posterior tibialis muscle. We don't have as perfect of a line of the back of the tibia as we would expect, and who knows, maybe I was somewhere between the fibula and the tibia. But again, I want to show you that the grayscale between the hyperechoic bone and the hypoechoic fluid allows for the fascicles of muscles to exist, and then the fascia, the fibroadipose layers that go between those muscle fibers. And then lastly, as a reminder, this is long strand collagen of the flexor tendons at the wrist 
covered by the darker fascicular structures of a nerve. And this white area here is the transcarpal ligament that makes up the carpal tunnel. This is the lunate bone and the capitate. Uh, again, you remember these echoes of bone. I want to finally uh, pull this all together as to what musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging is in physical therapy by reviewing and presenting a case study. This patient came to me with a diagnosis of right wrist pain. She had adhesions from inactivity because she had actually sustained a um, fall on her outstretched hand while she was out walking her dog. Um, and that was nine weeks before she actually came into my clinic. She went back to see the doctor and there was so much burning pain. The doctor's order said to me, get this wrist moving. The joint is freezing up, and certainly I can understand that concern after nine weeks and the joint not allowing a lot of bending or moving. She said that when she went to take her hand into flexion, she couldn't bend it forward at all without burning pain. However, the unique thing was she could take her other hand and bend that hand backwards almost to full extension. But when she actively tried to extend her hand, it simply wouldn't go. It would create such burning pain that she could not go further than that. And here actually is her hand, and represented by the circle, you can see where she said she had burning pain. So what I did is I said to myself, well, with ultrasound, we can screen for fluid. We can screen for if there's any bone problems. We can look again for the density. If, if there is scar tissue, we should be able to see it. And with imaging ultrasound, we are actually able to see the metabolics of inflammation. Or, I guess the final thing is, just to find what we find. So I got my gel. I placed it on the back of her wrist in the area of where she was hurting. And I began to move the probe proximal and distal. Now let me bring to your memory what actually we're looking at. This is a slice of the wrist right in the area that we're looking. And so this is our compartment number one of the dorsal wrist. The compartment number two has extensor carpi radialis brevis and longus. And then there's Lister's tubercle where I'm pointing at right here. So I knew the region that we were dealing with was the compartment two. So what I was going to do is take my Clarius scanner and I was gonna place it right over the top of those two tendons. And so I basically said, all right, this is what it would look like. I looked up an image. And again, we can see Lister's tubercle here. You know what the echo texture is for bone, and that's there. And you know we've taken a look at my uh, Achilles tendon. We were looking long axis, but if we cut it through, it's gonna look like we're looking down a broomstick or the broom bristles. So normal. ECRB would look a little bit like an oval structure that has dots on it. However, when I took the picture, this is what it looked like. Here is the dorsal surface of the radius. Lister's tubercle would be over here. But what I saw was a very enlarged extensor carpi radialis brevis that looked like it had a darker gray scale in it. And I had a normal looking extensor carpi radialis longus. So with this being a normal tendon, I could see that this was puffed up and we had like some fluid accumulation around here. But what really began to throw me was this bright area here with what looked like ring down. And if you remember that term before, it was related to hardware. So I decided I would turn my scanner on that particular point, and this is what I saw. This again is the distal radius, and coming up through the distal radius were two metal structures. And you can actually see the actual threading on these screws. You can see the fluid accumulation of inflammation where clearly it was painful that she couldn't move this because should she have actually actively extended her wrist, it would have bifurcated or at least torn through those tendons. 
This particular individual would have been shamed into trying to get movement. Ultimately, I, I did talk to the orthopedist and they removed the hardware and sadly enough, I didn't get to visit with her for too long because she improved so well she didn't need a lot of my help. So in summary, I'd like to go through a couple things as it relates to how I would put together what is musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging. It is a tool that shows us literally shows us what we have always only palpated. Musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging verifies structure integrity, a ligament, a bone, a tendon, a muscle. It allows me to quantify inflammation based on the amount of darkness, which is fluid, within a tendon. I'm able to watch that tendon become lighter and lighter until it actually compares directly to a healthy tendon. That allows me to be able to say, wow, you're quite a bit better than you were the last time we checked, but you still have a ways to go before the inflammation is completely gone. We can actually visually monitor inflammation changes. We can document healing as it relates to bone fracture closure. Whether a person can go back to play ahead of schedule can be determined simply based on the maturity of the callus that is filling in for a fracture. As you can clearly see, like a glass bottom boat, you can watch whatever is happening under that probe. And yes, I must admit, I practiced over 25 years before I even began using musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging, and so I am very aware of the manual testing tools the various techniques that we've learned to be able to differential diagnose where we can put groups of tests together and, and increase our sensitivity and our specificity of our testing. This is just another assessment tool in your doctor of physical therapy pocket. And finally, this is a tool for all of us to explore and discover. There are windows, acoustic windows into parts of the body that people have not even discovered or certainly not documented in research form. So much will be discovered in the future, and it will be discovered by people like you, clinicians, who actually say, well, I wonder, this is a tool for us to get and explore, and I challenge you, do it. This is Greg again, and I want to thank you for joining me the past half hour as I've talked about what is musculoskeletal ultrasound imaging, truly a passion of mine in the practice of physical therapy. I'd like to invite you as well to the next presentation where I want to present some case studies that I feel well platform what I believe to be uh, the value of musculoskeletal imaging in physical therapy and why I would like to have you consider the possibility of using it in your practice.